passage of biblical history, New Testament history, Christian history. We ended last week with me encouraging you to, when you went to the bathroom mirror in the morning last week every day and saw yourself in the mirror, to see a big F on your chest. And that F that you imagine to be on your chest stands for faithfulness. Amen. Because in our previous message, it was noted that we do have the testimony of biblical history on our side. Which means we should, with confidence, withstand all the criticism that comes at our faith. And not only withstand it with confidence, but also be merely unfazed by a society that is post-Christian and so often wants to belittle our faith or dismiss it or marginalize it. And so you ask, how'd you do? How'd you do uh, looking in the mirror every morning yourself, Pastor Tom, and seeing a big F on your chest? Well, I have a confession to make. When I looked in the mirror every morning last week and saw myself, the first thing that I thought is, man, you're getting old. <laughs> and I started concentrating on that and wondering how much it costs for Botox and maybe a, a modest facelift. And I forgot all about seeing myself with a big F on my chest. So I'm so sorry for that. I'll do better this week. Will you join me in seeing a big F on your chest this week when you look in the mirror? Well, what we saw last week, and it thrilled my soul, I haven't been able to get over it, is when we look at Paul's third missionary journey, um, basically, he is moving west, and uh, he's gotten as far as Greece, and his aim is to get as far as Spain. He's thinking even farther westward, Rome and Spain. But uh, he wants to go back to Jerusalem, before he makes it, he's got an offering for the saints there who were suffering. Uh, he's got an offering he wants to deliver to them. So he's going to go back to Jerusalem before he gets even farther west. But on his way back, he stops at Ephesus. And here in Ephesus, Ephesus, he stayed longer in that location than any other location in his whole time of ministry as God's first missionary, as God's apostle sent forth to the Gentiles. So we know just by the longevity of Paul's stay that the city of Ephesus must be epic in New Testament history. And I submit to you it very much is, as we talked about last week. But uh, Paul staying there that long, um, what we find out as we fast forward and, and, and look at history, we see with Ephesus then being in the process of becoming one of the leading centers of Christianity for centuries to come, we understand with that westward movement, and looking back now, we see that it was the Christian faith that made the West the West. When we enjoy Western civilization with its sophistication of law, its sophistication of education, the sophistication of art, the abundance, the affluence, the freedom, all of this is the benefit of Western civilization. It is the West, and we understand now when we look at the book of Acts and its history, that the reason why the West is the West is for one primary reason, our faith, Amen. the Christian faith. Amen. Now that just blows me away. And, you know, just so you'll know, um, it was the conversion of the barbarian kingdoms of Europe to Christ that laid the foundation of what has become our standard of living that we enjoy. Those things I talked about, affluence, abundance, freedom, literacy. Amen? Amen. And, and the conversion of these barbarian kingdoms to the West happened, listen to this, during the Dark Ages, between the 5th and 10th century. 
And it just kept going west from there and building on that and building on that. And then you get the crescendo of Western civilization, these United States of America, yeah? yeah? How many would like to live in America your whole life? Pretty good stuff, right? Pretty good stuff. So with that being said, let's get back to the history. And you know it's exciting, so don't think about it like other history. Get like Feather and get all pumped. History, yeah. Let's get back to the biblical history. You should be in Acts chapter 19. And we're going to look first at verses 11 and 12. Luke is being very, very specific now. Very detailed. Because all of this is, is making the point uh, that he wants Christians living well beyond his longevity to understand and appreciate. It says... With Paul being in the city of Ephesus and all that has gone on, there's a continuation of the manifestation of God's power upon him. It says, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. So if we look at, well, we'll hold off on the map, but, but what we see here is with, with Paul being there, what God is doing by these special miracles, the Bible says, where Paul would have handkerchiefs that would come in contact with him, or aprons, and those handkerchiefs and aprons would be taken to the sick and placed upon them and they'd miraculously be healed. Um, what is going on in Ephesus is the power of God is becoming evident in contrast to the other sources of power that claim to have power in that city. Remember, Ephesus is a city of 340,000 people in ancient times. And can you imagine all the religious fraud that was going on there. Think of times even more superstitious than here in our modern age, but we see so much religious fraud going on with us. How many drive down the street and see palm readers, uh, signs for palm readers? So it's always there. Human beings by nature are superstitious, but of course, because of our, our Western culture, we're less superstitious, but put yourself back in the first century and, and Paul has arrived in the city as a total stranger. He needed to be validated because there was a lot of stuff going on to try and rival him, to try and contest him, to try and quell him in this pure message of God that he was bringing, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, and his intention to start a church there, which would turn into the seven churches that we see in the book of Revelation that Jesus sent letters to, which would turn into a whole westward movement and what we've already talked about as the end result of that. Amen? Amen. Now, what about the city Ephesus and its 340,000 inhabitants? Do you realize that Ephesus had earned a reputation for being the magic capital of the world? Amen. Ephesus and what Paul came up against there, the darkness and demonic pit powers that he was up against, he was basically beginning one of the most prominent Christian centers in all the world for centuries. He was beginning that where? In a city that had a reputation for being the capital of magic. So God does these amazing things through Paul's ministry in order to validate his teaching. Let's look at the map again. He was sent from Antioch, and he's come all this way with just a little band of people all that way westward, and he's here for almost three years, right around three years, and in a city that big, without this manifestation of power, with all the other magic and stuff that was going on, he, he wouldn't have gotten any traction at all, perhaps. Or certainly wouldn't have been able to prove his validity as Jesus' chosen apostle to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to bring the kingdom of God to the Gentiles. 
He wouldn't have been able to do that without this awesome power that God gave him that we read about. Look at it again in verse number 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of whom? Paul. Paul. Let's go on and read verses 13 through 16 now. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took, it up, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. So this kind of sets up what I was telling you about. Paul is doing these things, and here you get these copycats, these knockoffs. It says they're vagabonds. That means they wandered around like gypsies, making a living out of supposedly being able to perform exorcisms. And man, they see this, that Paul is really casting out demons in the name of Jesus. So they say in their superstition and nativity, they say, oh, we can do that now. All we've got to do is use that magic name of Jesus, and we can do just like Paul. Think about the money that we're going to rake in. Mm -hmm. So they like Paul's technique of casting out demons by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Look at verse number 14. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and the chief of the priests, not priests in a good way, which did so. Kind of priests in a mystical, magical Judaism, a, a syncretism of, of religions. He was, he was an apostate Jew, no doubt. And so these seven sons of Sceva, they decided to do this, to, to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, and they were going to really get a, a, a windfall of, of money out of this. And so when they tried this on a person who was really possessed, no faking here, a really possessed person, it says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man of whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against him so that they fled out of the, that house naked and wounded. So, again, this little snippet of, of narrative gets you to see what Paul was up against. Every step he took, there were people who wanted to exploit the situation and take him two steps backwards. And these guys were up to that. And that's how hard it is to build a church, right? Does anybody know I talk about looking in the mirror and I'm aging? Does anybody know how hard it is to build a church in, in big metropolitan areas? Very, very difficult. You get so much inertia, you get so much pushback, it will drive you nuts. The only way you keep your sanity is by the power and grace of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. But again, God has big plans for this city of Ephesus. And what he's doing is he's making no mistake about it with everybody who's watching that Paul is the real deal and everybody else is a knockoff. So you better stick with Paul. It kind of reminds me one time a guy in our church went to New York and he came back home and he said, Pastor Tom, I saw a guy out in the corner of Vendor and he was selling Rolex watches. So I bought you a Rolex. I said, oh my goodness, I've always wanted one. One time I took a trip to Palm Springs to find a used one that I could afford. And I went to all the shops in Palm Springs and couldn't even find a used one I could afford. So the fact that he came back from New York with a Rolex for Pastor Tom that he got from a street vendor, I was all too happy to show my wares. I put that watch on and wore it, and it did and indeed said Rolex on it. And uh, it got to the point where if I was walking down the street and people made eye contact with me, I said, oh, you needed to know the time? And I'd stick my wrist out to let them see Rolex and give them the time, even though they really didn't need to know the time. But then one day, this watch that claimed to be a Rolex stopped working. And I was like, wait a minute. Rolexes don't have batteries, especially cheap ones that don't last very long. So then I wore it a few more days, and uh, I was realizing that this was a phony. I wore it a few more times, even though it wasn't working, because at least it was right two times a day. 
Um, but I still showed it off because I was hoping someone would try and steal it from me. <laughs> Every chance I could get, I was, you know, showing the brand and like, Rolex this, buddy. Because <laughs> I thought that what I could do is claim it on my homeowner owner's insurance. <laughs> and if they asked me about it, they said, what kind of watch was stolen? And I was like, one that had the brand name of Rolex on it. <laughs> but what is my point? Anybody can say that they're the real deal, but the truth is what's on the inside and what empowers it. This says it's a Rolex, but it is not energized by the same principle that a Rolex is energized, a real Rolex is energized. And everybody was going around trying to emulate Paul, but he was the one who got validated, and it was his truth and his message, the word of God, that God was validating, right? Hence, we get seven dudes all beat up and even naked because they tried to mess with a demon with their false Rolex credentials. And it didn't work out too well, right? So from these events, what I want us to see in the rest of our text today is that Luke highlights four elements that will always keep the church authentic and always make it an impactful force in every cultural setting. You say, man, we live in a post-Christian society. I feel like, you know, not even telling anybody I'm a Christian. I feel like not even trying anymore. What's the use? I would suggest to you that it's no worse now than it was with Paul in Ephesus. And we're going to see from history again, we are getting a shot of biblical history to keep us motivated, to keep us pumped, to keep us... What's that on our chest? Faithful. Uh, and, and what we're going to see in this little snippet of history, we're going to see that there are four things that if you take advantage of it, they will always, always, always keep you authentic, like Paul. And will always, always, always allow you to have a positive, meaningful impact wherever you go in life. How many think that that sounds pretty good? Amen. So let's look at these four things. The first thing we see after those uh, seven sons got beaten and bloody, and the result of that, the first thing we see, the first element that always must be present with us is fear. If we want to be authentic before God, if we want to have an impact for Him, we have to walk in fear before him. We need to possess the fear of the Lord. Yeah. Now, what does this word fear mean? It doesn't mean that you walk around and you're afraid anytime you mess up and sin that God is going to send the lightning bolt your way. No, this fear means terror in the sense that we realize he's all holy, right? But it also smooths out to mean respect and reverence. So look at uh, our verse. Look at our verse Verse number 17. What we just talked about with the fakers, it, it builds on it now in verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling where? At Ephesus. Acts 19.17. And what fell on them all? Fear fell on them all. All. So what did God want for the people who he was seeking to uh, transform their lives? What did he want to start out with? He wanted to start out with what? Fear. fear. Look at it again. And fear fell on all of them. Now we think about Ephesus, we think about our society today. If people want the benefit of having God in their lives and having that benefit of what God can do in their lives, but they refuse to have a healthy fear of God, they're wasting their time. Remember the thief on the cross that got saved? There was two thieves. Only one got saved. And what did he do with the unbelieving one who went to hell? He chided him and he said, what? Don't you fear God? 
seeing that we are in the same place, we're going to die, and we are guilty, we deserve to die, but this Jesus does not deserve to die. Don't you see what's going on here? That God is doing something so powerful, and you're not reverencing that, you're not respecting that. And so this guy, with his last breath, says to the other knucklehead, you don't fear God? Are you loco? Don't you see this manifestation of God? And you, you, you don't have fear. My goodness. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, read it out loud with me. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The fear of the Lord is our method of persuasion. Intiende. What did God use in all of this that was going on with Paul? He produced fear among them all. The absence of fear is one of the reasons why our Western church today is so anemic and so irrelevant. It is that necessary element is not seen by God and so consequently God is not pouring out His Spirit and blessing like He did in Ephesus. I really appreciate it when I see people come into the church house and the first thing they do is they sit down before service and they have a quiet time alone with God. I see them praying. I see them examining their lives. I see them confessing sin. I see them wanting to draw near unto the Lord. I see them getting serious that in a few moments we're going to sing unto Him and we don't want to sing with hypocritical lips. I love to see people who come to their pews and prepare their hearts. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Think about, again, more history. We are fortifying ourselves, not with whimsical thoughts. We are going back to the book, and we are getting in history. Think about another time in history where God brought fear to all the people. It was when Israel had gone through the exodus and was ready to go into the promised land and have conquest over all the heathen in the land. Let's go and see what is the overarching theme that made Israel's success possible. Let's see where that all starts. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and find verse number 10. If you're using the church Bible, the page number's up there for you. Deuteronomy 4, 10. Moses is reminding them they need to have respect and reverence for Jehovah. It should be a way of life. And he brings them back to that time when God spoke uh, on the mount where he gave Moses the commandments, the Ten Commandments. He says, especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to what? Fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Parents, if you're not teaching your children to fear the Lord, you are doing them a terrible disservice. Let's go on over to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 29. Again, I said this is the overarching theme that God is giving them to make them successful. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would what? Fear me. Fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with, again, he mentions the next generation, and with their children forever. Why have we lost the younger generation? Could it be that we have not shown a proper respect and reverence for our God? Could it be that our children have not seen a good, healthy fear of God that they should see? I don't know. I'm just asking. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 2. That thou mightest what? Fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, that, that thou, 
and again the next generation, and thy son, and the next generation, and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, and all thy days may be prolonged. You see, Western civilization started with the culture that Paul created in Ephesus, and that was Western civilization was built on fearing and respecting the Lord. Look at verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to what? Fear the Lord our God, for our God good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is to, at this day. The fear of God is for the good of society. Let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and find verse number 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to what? Fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. One more. Unless you want me to go even further, I can. Let me see what time it is with my Rolex. Oh, no, we better just do one more. Uh, verse number 20. Thou shalt what? Fear the Lord thy God, him shall thou serve, and to him shall thou cleave, and swear by his name. Amen. So we see, just like with Paul's ministry, that it all begins. What keeps us authentic? What gives us an impactful force in our culture? How did it all start? You saw it right there, as clear as black ink on white paper. So let's go back to Acts chapter 19 because we said there were four elements. The first element was fear. The second element is the name of the Lord Jesus magnified. That's the second element that always must always be part of you. If you want to be authentic and impactful in your Christian life. It's got to be all about magnifying whom? Yeah. With our lives. Jesus. Now what does that mean? It says, look at verse number 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them. That was number one. And number two, the second element, the, and the name of the Lord Jesus was what? Magnified. What does it mean to magnify the name of the Lord? It means to glorify the name of the Lord. It means to regard that name highly. It means to praise the name of the Lord. It means to exalt the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So even though Paul was prominent, people were trying to copycat him, he became a big name, he became a celebrity, even though Paul was so prominent in what God was doing, the end result of what Paul did did not make his name magnified. All that Paul did resulted in what? Jesus' name being magnified. Amen. And we think about the worship team. I complimented them today, and I'm sure that as you compliment them, the first thing they're thinking is, I'm just an instrument of the Lord. And if you were lifted up by the music today, then let's just make sure that it's all about, be, you were lifted up because we're magnifying his name. Amen? Amen. Such a necessary element. Let me tell you about my typical prayer for you after Sunday. Usually after Sunday, I'm kind of tired. And I don't get into a lot of details in my prayers, but usually what I'll do is I think back and I'm seeing all of your faces on Sunday and realizing that you took these steps toward Jesus, and I'm hoping that that will kill a doubt because you've taken these steps towards him. And when I kneel to pray, I look and I think of all your faces that I've seen while I'm up here preaching, and I say, Lord, you know everybody that was in your house yesterday, and you know that they knew that when they were coming here, they were going to praise Jesus. They knew that when they were coming here, they were going to hear the word of Jesus. They, knowing that Lord, voluntarily came and assembled together, knowing full well that this meeting is all about Jesus Christ. And they came. Amen. 
because they want it that way. That's what they want. And so I say, think of them, Lord. Look on them for every single one of them that voluntarily assembled to praise the name of Jesus, Lord. And then I start asking blessings upon you. And not little blessings. I ask that God, in the name of Jesus, give you kingdom power in your lives. That means extending your finances beyond what is possible. That means making your health healthier than what is humanly possible. Amen? Amen. But it's all based on this element that I can't help it. I just appreciate because I don't put a gun to any of your heads. I don't even call you on Saturday night and remind you, hey, church is tomorrow. Are you coming? I just let you live, and the way you live is you make it here. Amen? Amen. So give yourself a hand. No, magnify the name of the Lord. <laughs> Let's look at the third principle, if we may. We go to two verses, Acts 19, 18, and 19. With fear going on, and Jesus' name being magnified, we're going to see some incredible stuff happen. There's going to be some deliverance. There's going to be some victory. You can't have the fear of the Lord and be mad, wanting to magnify the name of Jesus without God setting you free. Without God delivering you. Without God taking you out of bondage. It's impossible. And what we're going to see at this point is God is moving in and He is going to be the bondage breaker. What was the city of Ephesus um, uh, famous for? Magic. Magic. God's going to go to work on all those people who were trapped in sorcery and magic, who were in bondage to their superstition. Look what happens in verse 18. And many that believed came and did what? Confessed, Confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts, a.k.a. magic, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Mm -hmm. I hope to be able to check out this DVD in Heaven's Library and see that bonfire. Oh, that's going to be so much fun to see that video of those people taking those evil, wicked, dark books that are demonically inspired and throwing it in the fire. Mm -hmm. I hope that fire got 10 feet high. I'm hoping to see that on the DVD. Mm -hmm. But they burned all their books. But this brings us to the third element that is always necessary for us to stay impactful and authentic, and that is confession. Look at verse number 18. And they that believed came and did what? Best. This means obviously by the fact that they were bringing the books that they had, their contraband, their stash that they were hiding. You see, they were still wanting to cleave to their old life of superstition. That's what Grandma taught them. They were having a hard time getting away from that. But God's power was working. And it got to the point where they couldn't take it any longer. They needed to confess. And it was an open confession. It was to confess means to admit that no child of God should have books of magic in his or her home. Amen? Amen. And they did it publicly. They wanted a praise. I mean, can you imagine that fire is this high and then they bring their books maybe in a wheelbarrow and dump it in and then the fire is that high. Praise the Lord. Look at this. A bonfire and all of our superstition is being burned up before the power of God. We're no longer in bondage. He's broke the bondage of what Luke very kindly calls curious arts, which I'm not so kind. I would say the bondage of nonsense, the bondage of balderdash. How many believe in magic? The tense of the verb in the Greek here indicates that the people kept confessing. And that's why we come to church, is we're always learning, we're always getting closer and closer to the Lord, and sin is like an onion. You can just keep peeling it away and peeling it away and peeling it away in your life. We're always getting more sophisticated spiritually, and we come to church, 
and we magnify the name of the Lord and we get reassociated with the fear that we're supposed to have and the natural byproduct of that is we keep on always confessing. I suppose every Sunday at some point in the church service I have a moment of confession because I feel so unworthy to get up here and preach before you all. But this is, is what happened. Think about the word confession. Look at this. I like this quote. In confession, we are called to do what no human does naturally and easily to go on record against whom? Ourselves. Confession is going on record against ourselves. Lord, I need to clean this up in my life. I am, I am unworthy. I am an unclean thing. But Lord, your grace can set me free. Amen? So it all starts It all starts with our confession. And then once we confess, God does the heavy lifting. Amen? Amen. And again, that's why church never should be mundane. People get bored with church. I'm like, well, what are you doing? Are you, are you concentrating on yourself? If church is bored, are you just sitting here going through the motions? Taking in the content in one ear and out the other? I hope not. I hope when you come to church, you're doing like these precious believers are. You're going to work on yourself, and it comes to a point of confession, and before you know it, you have great victory in your life. Amen. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I'm going to be But when I get to heaven. But one thing I promise you, I'm not what I used to be. And that all starts with confession. Amen. How many are following me today? Amen. We're talking about four elements, and now we come to number four. Look at verse number 20, if you will. <clears throat> we had seen that they burned their books, and Luke again gives a specific of 50,000 pieces of silver. There's so many numbers that I've heard about this night and nobody never knows for sure because they weren't there. Some people try and take it back to what the value was at that time, those pieces of silver, and they equate it to 10 grand. Other people take it from that time and mature it through 2,000 years and say it will have equivalency of today of millions of dollars of burned books. But how could they, how could they give up such an investment Thousands of maybe millions of dollars of books because they found the one book that they need and the only book that they need. Look at verse number 20. So mightily grew what? The Word, the word of God. And prevailed. So this answers our question. People wonder, why do we no longer see miracles in the church like Paul performed back then? And hopefully I've answered that for you. Those miracles served a very specific purpose of Paul's message being validated in a huge city of much darkness and much confusion religiously. He needed to be singled out as Christ's true apostle. So it was a momentary thing to validate him to get Christianity moving westward, which was God's plan. And so that's why he was endowed with these. But now today, what Paul taught was validated and recorded, and now we have it in print. We have the entire complete Word of God, the stuff that he was preaching back then orally, we possess in writing, so it no longer needs to be validated. It already has been. Amen. What he taught is now in our hands in 66 books. So we don't need no more miracles. All we need is this prescription. Verse 20, read it out loud with me. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. It's already been validated. It will prevail. There is no need for miracles anymore. You say, oh man, but that's kind of boring. I wish I could have been there and took in Paul's teaching orally to have those miracles to go along with. I mean, how exciting would have that been? Now think about that lust of yours right now. 
Do you realize how hard it would have been to get Paul's oral teaching to follow him around? He was everywhere. And some places he went, he got beat up. You want to be near that? Other places he went, he got stoned. Other places he went, he got incarcerated. You sure you want to follow him around? If you would have been on the ship with him, he got shipwrecked. Yeah. And then when he got on that, that island, he got bit by a snake. You don't want to be hanging out with Paul to see miracles. No. You want to be able to take this and set at your breakfast table with a good cup of black coffee. No additives. And open this up and just get cozy up with God. Right? It's so wonderful. And when we open this book, because it's the Word of God, it prevails in our life. As we share it with others, it prevails in our life. What does prevail mean? It means it had a powerful effect. This past week I had to do a memorial service. I was a little intimidated. There were people there that were trained in medicine, a psychiatrist who had been... Uh, got his, his medical degree from Yale. And there's a lot of academia for this service. And I'm like, I'm thinking of little old podunk me, you know. And, and yet, when I got up there, you know, the Holy Spirit just, just put comfort in my heart because uh, I was able to share the Word of God with them. It became very exciting. And by the time I got up there, I was like, I know I'm in the midst of some very educated atheists and agnostics. And I feel a little defenseless, but I decided, you know how I'm going to defend the Word of God in this service? I'm going to defend it just the same way that I defend the lion. I'm going to open the cage and let it loose. Mm -hmm. And I began to preach the Word of God, and I cannot believe all eyes were riveted on me. Amen. And the word of God prevails, doesn't it? It has a powerful effect. So let me give you a couple quotes and then we're done. This is from Os Guinness again, this gentleman that I've been reading. I came upon this book by an author from Focus on the Family. They said, if you send us a donation, we'll send you this book by Os Guinness. I was like, well, the way you describe that book... I think I want it, so yeah, I'll give you a little donation. And the book came, and it's just blown me away. But uh, Oskina says, out of each individual conversion should come a silent personal revolution that transforms the personal lives of the converted, which will lead in turn to a social public revolution in a wider society as such a way of life and thought spreads and is demonstrated by the people of God together. And that's exactly what happened in Ephesus. Paul started a culture in paganism. That culture stuck. That culture extended. And that culture that Paul started in the midst of all that dark magic and paganism became not just a culture, but it was so collective, it was so strong, and it expanded so far, it became a civilization. Amen. What kind of civilization? Probably should W. Did you say that? Who said that? Did you say that, Terry? Someone said Western over here. Sylvia did? Oh. Well, I'm kind of like my Rolex. My ears stopped working. <laughs> Another quote. We have it up on the screen for you. I want you to read it with me as we celebrate this history that we have that makes you and me strong. Read this with me. It is, it is still always God's power that changes culture, but it is God's power at work in His people who are aligned with Him, living in His truth, and serving His purpose in their generation. So everybody's wringing their hands. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? There's not much we can do, but there's one thing we can do. That right there. Let God's power work in us and align our living to His truth and serve His purpose in our generation. And there'll be a natural byproduct of that where you will impact your culture. Please stand.
This week, every morning, when you look in the bathroom mirror, or your bedroom dresser mirror, what I want you to see in yourself is I want you to see yourself as a camel. Now for me, my last name is Burns. It'll come very naturally. See yourself in that mirror as a candle. And realize that as you live for God, it is impossible for you not to have an influence on your overall larger society in some way. And every morning when you get up, see yourself as a burning candle for the Lord. Imagine yourself as being that and understand there is not enough darkness in all the world to put out the light of even one small candle. That candle is you. You're going out into a dark world, but because you know Jesus Christ, because you have the Holy Spirit, because you have faith, all this darkness comes at us, and all that darkness does not have the power to put out your light. Amen. It simply does not. Just like last week with the big F on our chest, like Superman, the bullets can bounce off us, the criticism against our faith, because we know whom we believe in. And we're persuaded that he is able. So we're, we're unfazed by the criticism. We're also unfazed by the darkness, because we know that all the darkness in all the world does not have the power to put out our life, right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're such a wonderful shepherd in our lives. It would be great just to have anecdotes from the Bible to dwell on. But you're so serious for us, Lord. You're so about equipping us for our generation that you give us pure history. And Lord, we thank you for what it does in our lives. We learn the lessons of history and we benefit from it. So I praise you for these dear people, Lord, even like I said, they knew what they were getting when they came here, and they came joyfully and willfully, and Lord, I pray your strongest blessings upon them, and Lord, it is tough times, and I hope that you help us to recalibrate and get back to the history of this Bible that we've seen today, and know that we've got to have these four elements in our lives. We need to have a good, healthy fear of you all the time just have to have that. We need to always be about magnifying the Lord, Jesus, His name. May our Christianity never be about our ego. That would give the wrong message. We need to, Lord, we need to always be confessing. As we saw this word in the tense in the Greek means keep on confessing. And Lord, we always need to share your word because when the word grows mightily, it will prevail. So, Lord, let this grace be upon all those who have heard this message today for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Amen.